Let's dive into our current understanding of the standard model of particle physics. Particle physics focuses on the study of subatomic structure of atoms as we know them. Consider an apple, a physical thing we can see and touch made of matter. Matter is then recognized as any of the elemental atoms from the periodic table. These atoms have a nucleus that is made of protons and neutrons, and you may think this is where the fun stop, but there's more levels to this story. Protons and neutrons can be described by even more fundamental constituents called quarks, and also, we have the electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus. How did this happen? If you take a look at the history of the universe right after the universe goes through super fast inflation, we have a soup of electrons, quarks, and other particles. These quarks then clump up to form protons and neutrons, and later continue to be bounded and combined with electrons to form atoms like hydrogen and helium. In hindsight, subatomic physics looks at very short distances, early times of the universe, and very high energy densities. The current understanding of fundamental particles and the interactions between them, it's called the standard model of particle physics. All ordinary matter belongs to this group. For the most part, these existed in the early moments after the Big Bang. Interactions are mediated by bosons. These describe the type of forces the quarks and leptons are subjected to. Each particle has an antimatter counterpart, sort of like a mirror image. Let's start with the most basic particles that you may already know. For example, from beta decay. For the leptons, we have electron and electron neutrino. And for the quarks, all nucleons are bound states of up quarks and down quarks. So these four spin half fermions become the most basic constituents of matter. A fun fact is that nature replicates itself and there are in fact three generations of quarks and leptons. These higher generations undergo identical interactions. Their only difference is that the mass of the particles and generations are successively heavier. You may be wondering, why three generations? And you're not alone. Most physicists wonder the same since the symmetry or structure is not yet understood. Combining relativity and quantum mechanics implies that every particle has a corresponding antiparticle. Compared to its matter partner, an antiparticle has equal mass but opposite electric charge and opposite additive quantum numbers. For example, opposite color charge. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Here's an example, the positron. This is the antiparticle of the electron, otherwise known as the anti-electron. It was first discovered in 1931 by Carl Anderson. And here we have an example of how its particle track is very different from the electron. Notation-wise, we often use a bar over a symbol or a plus-minus sign to indicate an antiparticle. For a more technical interpretation, and somewhat fast, we can talk about these particles and how they play a role in the Schrodinger and Klein-Gordon equations. Quantum mechanics describes the momentum and energy in terms of operators, just so. We use these operators in the known energy-momentum relationship. This gives a time-dependent Schrodinger equation where the solution with the definite energy E is given as so. Here, psi is a function that would describe the particle of interest. However, for particles near the speed of light, the energy-momentum relationship is different, as so. The solutions to this Klein-Gordon equation can be either positive or negative. Negative solutions are a direct result of the squared energy termed in the previous relationship. We interpret these as antiparticles. Now let's think about forces. At subatomic scales, interactions between particles and nuclei are caused by three subatomic forces. The electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. The interactions due to these forces are evident in scattering. For example, the scattering of proton on proton at the LHC or Large Hadron Collider. Here, we have bunches of protons that are scattered off at the center of each experiment. We also have particle decay. For example, 
decay of radioactive nuclei, or decays of cosmic ray muons. Another interaction is nuclear fission and fusion. For example, reactions in a nuclear reactor. Starting with the strong force, hence the name, the strong force, this force acts only on quarks and is propagated by gluons. There's eight types in total. Next in scale, the second strongest force is the electromagnetic force, which acts on charged particles and is propagated by the photon. The third strongest force, known as the weak force, acts on all particles and can be propagated by a charged W boson or a neutral Z boson. Finally, we have the weakest force of all, gravity. This force acts on all particles but is negligible at particle physics scale. The quantum mechanical description uses messenger particles to propagate the force between particles. These messenger particles are spin-1 bosons. For example, beta decay is propagated by a negatively charged W boson. Every particle which feels the electromagnetic force carries an electric charge, either positive or negative. The strong and weak forces also have charges associated with them. For example, the color charge. Only quarks and gluons experience the strong force. Every quark carries a color charge quantum number, either red, blue, or green. This is in addition to their electric charge. Every antiquark also carries a color charge quantum number, either anti-red, anti-blue, or anti-green. There's also the weak hypercharge. All quarks and leptons experience the weak force. The weak hypercharge is a charge associated with the weak force. One thing to note is that free quarks have never been observed. Quarks are locked inside hadrons and hadrons are bound states of quarks of either a pair or a trio. Let me introduce you to the two types of hadrons, mesons and baryons. There's also antibaryons. The charge of a hadron is always an integer multiple of the electric charge E. The color charge of hadrons is always neutral. First up, we have mesons. Mesons are a bound state of a quark-antiquark pair. They're considered bosons with integer spin. An example of a meson are pions. Then we have baryons, which are three quark bound states. They're considered fermions, meaning that they have fractional spin. For example, the proton and the neutron. And an example of an antibaryon would be the antiproton. So now that we saw the different particle properties, we can ask ourselves, what can particles do? The main interactions that we saw is particle scattering, which can be elastic or inelastic, but we mainly consider it inelastic. For example, the scattering of an electron and positron producing a pair of muons. We also saw particle decay, such as beta decay or muon decay. And with that, we have finished an introduction to the standard model of particle physics an elegant theory that describes accurately almost all measurements in particle physics. And now, our learning journey continues.